It was literally the second I turned around and I saw a wall of yellow and orange. She was deteriorating by the hour and we were running short of time. Her chance of survival might be as slim as 10%. There was an emergency exit door which had broken open in the crash, but it was engulfed in flames. I turned back to look for Alan and he didn't show. In a major burn situation, there is no time to lose. And then he did appear, landed on the ground, and he was terribly burnt. You either improve or you deteriorate rapidly. We had to act fast. We had to act decisively. I alerted the skin bank personnel to be ready. I prepared my team of nurses as well as the OT nurses. It felt as though my skin was being peeled off. This is Taiwan most I just remember leaning back as the ambulance drove off, and I was feeling really, really sleepy and really, really cold. But the paramedic wouldn't let me sleep. He, would just, he was just like, nope, 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 don't sleep. And I was like, let me sleep. I was in an international conference where a lot of the plastic surgeons from Taiwan were attending as well. The next day, when I presented my paper, I realised the auditorium was almost empty. And this was because most of them were recalled to their hospital to attend to the mass casualty accident. I was at home and I read on the front page of the papers that a Singaporean girl had been badly burnt in a water park fire in Taiwan and there were around 500 casualties all young people. I immediately got in touch with my colleague, Dr. Chiu. I was in a taxi to the airport when my head of department, Prof Tan, called me and I recalled telling the taxi driver to immediately turn around and head towards the hospital she was in. Eighteen-year-old Singaporean Megan Loy was in Taiwan for a high school graduation trip with friends. I think we were about day five into our trip in Taiwan that uh, we went for this, uh, this colour play music festival thing. The idea of going to a festival was so foreign to me at the time because I'd never been to one before. And I just remember shuffling along with my friends uh, in the crowd. Normally, I just kind of steer clear from people, and I'm typically the kind of person that gets pushed all the way to the back. But with my friends, I felt a bit braver, you know, safety in numbers, that kind of thing. And we just thought it would be fun. So we just slowly muscled our way to the front of the, uh, the concert venue. But, you know, no amount of camaraderie can make up for bad music. And so about halfway through the last song, we decided that we were just going to muscle our way out regardless. It was literally the second I turned around. It was just like, I turned around and I saw people and then I saw like just, just a wall of yellow and orange. just a split second afterwards, like the screaming and the running and the chaos and everything happened. This because there were a of 
它起火的过程大概有达四十秒左右啦。I tried to run as fast as I could, but I didn't really feel like I was making the distance. People were just like knocking into each other, and there was just a lot of screaming. It was just absolute chaos. 其实现场会有很多像，呃，就是烤肉的味道，对啊，那些都是患者，哎，烧烫伤，哎，所产生出来的味道，对啊，在夹杂他们身上都有擦防晒乳啊，所以其实那味道其实还蛮印象蛮深刻。At that point, I I remember not feeling much. Pain. As I kind of came to my senses a little bit more, I like looked up at my arms, and then I saw that there were just these huge、uh, sheets of skin that were just falling off,、um, like my arms. Then, because at that time they were wearing shorts, so. 我们后续到现场就看到地上有布满着满满的拖鞋，然后都是粘在地上，然后还有，哎，会有一些血水啊在地上。哎，现场我们很明显的就是他们没有办法直接对他们进行搬运，因为我们一碰到他们身上的皮就会掉下来。所以现场我们都会利用现泳圈啊，或者是或者是其他现场可以辅助的搬运器材，然后协助他们上救护车。Megan's parents found out about the fire from her friends. In the ensuing chaos, their contacts in Taipei called some twenty hospitals before they managed to locate her the next day. I've reached the hospital at 10:30 in the morning, and I headed straight to the intensive care unit. But I was, of course, met with a lot of skepticism after I identified myself as a plastic surgeon from Singapore. They had only accepted after I've shown them a photo of the group of speakers of the plastic surgery conference that I had attended two days ago, and I met up with the consultant in charge treating. Megan's、uh, wounds at that time. And then the next thing I knew, I woke up and my parents were there. They were like, "Hi, we're here. Don't worry, we're gonna get you back." I think I remember being just so, so relieved. The first thing I said to them was like, "I'm sorry." <laughs> I don't really know why I said it. It might have been just like sorry that this happened, or also just sorry for everything. Um, that I maybe did. Oh no. <laughs> um, yeah. So、um, it was just. Yeah, I don't know. I couldn't. I couldn't really explain it. But it was just a lot of relief and just feeling so apologetic that this happened.、Um, and、um, you know, just imagining how worried that they would have been. So I was just kind of apologizing for that too. In a mass casualty situation, the limited resources available should be funneled towards、uh, victims who have a good chance of survival. Among all the victims, Megan was among the most severely injured, at 80% burns. So my fear was that the scant resources available might be diverted away from her care. So for her parents, I held nothing back. They wanted me to be entirely honest, and I told them that they have a very narrow window of deciding to transfer her back to Singapore because she was deteriorating by the hour, and we were running short of time. These patients can deteriorate fairly rapidly due to the loss of heat, loss of fluid,、uh, loss of protein. They can go into multi-organ failure. Severe overwhelming infection, 
And this can happen within the first 48, 72 hours. One of the factors that made me decide to get Megan back is that in Taiwan, where they had no national skin bank facility, the skin uh, had to be imported, and uh, this would take time. In SGH, fortunately, we have a ready skin bank with a stockpile that is prepared specifically for situations such as this. I alerted the skin bank personnel to be ready. With 80% burns, a lot of skin in store would have to be mobilised. Once Megan's family gave clearance, International SOS dispatched a Learjet to Taiwan and with Dr. Chu accompanying, they took off for their five-hour flight home. During the flight, of course, it was anxious for me because I am always thinking whether I made the right call. Towards the second half of the flight, we realised that kidney function was uh, being affected. Her blood pressure was a little bit unstable. She was spiking high temperatures. At that point, of course, I was very worried that I may have given the wrong advice to the parents and things might go seriously wrong. And I wasn't able to salvage the situation. Singaporean teenager Megan Loy was badly injured in one of Taiwan's worst fires. She's rushed home. But three days have passed, and her condition is critical. On the Monday evening, when I know the estimated time of arrival for Megan, I prepare my team of nurses, as well as the OT nurses, I also activate the intensivists on duty. Singapore General Hospital has Southeast Asia's only specialised burns treatment facility. With two operating theatres, an intensive care unit and a skin bank. That Tuesday morning on her arrival, I went down to Block 4 to make sure that the security is at the lift there to stand by the lift. So when Megan touched down to SGH, the, the path is open for her to reach the lift and reach the ward smoothly. When I see Megan's father, he looks very lost. And I went to introduce myself and reassure him that we will take very good care of her. We confirmed that she had suffered 80% burns to her body, and these were mainly third-degree flame burns. So in an 80% burn, the rule of thumb is you will have about maybe 20% chance of survival. And we add on about 10% for her lung injuries. So we were very frank to them that her chance of survival might be slim, as slim as 10%. Uh, so I recall that the parents were very, very upset and for the first time, I actually saw that Joseph was actually crying and was inconsolable. I just remember feeling really helpless, not being able to move for one. The room is dark and there's not as much uh, activity that's going on outside the room and there was no distraction from the, all the discomfort that I was having. I also had these nightmares of standing in like a burning field um, all alone. And I remember I couldn't sleep at all. It was really bad. I would stare at the clock and I'd just count the minutes. Every time I'd, I'd close my eyes and I'd open it and it'd be like five minutes would have passed. I'm like, okay, okay. There's just another 10 minutes until it's like maybe 3.15. I remember the nurses were so nice to me. I think one of the nurses, she just told me, you know what, it's okay, I'll just be sitting outside your room, okay? So she would drag a chair over and she would sit outside the room. And then I would just like look at the clock at the time passing and I'll look at her and I'll be like, oh, okay, there's someone out there. And then I'll be able to sleep for maybe an hour or so. So 
So for major burns such as uh, what Megan had suffered, a lot of what the outcome is depends on what we do during the first few days. Skin, being the largest organ in the body, when it's severely damaged, puts a tremendous strain on the heart. The patient is in shock and the heart is racing to cope with all the fluid losses in the body. Once she arrives to the ward, we start to prepare her for surgery later that very morning. When we get a phone call from the operating theatre, the first thing we will have to do is to charge this transport container that will hold the uh, donor skin. To charge this container, we need to fill it up with liquid nitrogen, let it go down to a temperature of minus 70 degrees and below. Our skin forms a continuous barrier against the external environment. When skin is lost, we immediately lose heat, moisture and resistance to infection. Temporary cover using skin from our skin bank is critical as a stopgap measure. We can load the skin from our main supply tank to this transport container. The SGH skin bank had immediate supplies to treat Megan Loy in 2015, but this was not always the case. The skin bank was set up in 1998, but in those formative years, poor public awareness meant that skin was always in short supply. So SGH relied mainly on Australia for its donor skin. But everything changed after one of Asia's most devastating terrorist attacks. I was on night duty. It was a normal night. I pick up a phone from ISOS. Then they told me that there's a body bomb and a lot of people was affected and they want to know what is our big capacity in Singapore General Hospital, how big is our burn centre and how many casualties can we bring in. I told them, then they say, be prepared, we might be sending the casualty to Singapore for treatments. So when I put out the phone, I was actually very scared and it's like, what's happening? Then I went to do an internet search to see, to verify the news, but I couldn't find anything then. Towards morning, about 3 a.m., I went back to do an internet search. And by then, the news was all over already. At least 180 have been killed in the terror attack, the worst ever in Indonesia. And I know that it's real. And we are expecting to be very busy. The number counters off as so many bodies were charred beyond recognition. The ward was very empty. I'm told there are still people missing and the hospitals are struggling to cope. Everything was all ready because we are not sure how many casualties is coming. So they actually prepared all the beds to receive the patients. The whole place was very, very quiet. More victims of the Bali blast have been brought here for treatment. When the 16 patients came to Singapore, we couldn't get the donated skin from Australia. And understandably, because many Australians were burned at the Bali bomb blast, and they need this precious resource to treat their own citizen first. So thankfully, I had another contact in the US Skin Bank, which managed to send us some skin to treat those severe burns cases. The top priority was to excise all burnt skin before infection set in. Respiratory failure and sepsis are the leading causes of death in severe burns. Inside the ward, it was chaos because you got nurses from other ward coming to help us. The surgeons is like continuous doing operation for the patients. You can see that even towards the evening, towards the night, they are still operating. The Bali bomb blast really emphasised the importance of having to be self-sufficient, uh, having a ready stockpile of donated skin in readiness, not just in the local context, but also for the region. After the experience of the Bali bombings, 
SGH built up its donor skin bank and skin culturing capabilities to become the first port of call for all critical burns cases in Southeast Asia. Ten years on, the skin bank would prove useful in an especially difficult case. It was Christmas morning, 2012, and my husband Alan and I were traveling through Myanmar. We got on the plane. It was delightful and cheerful. It was just one of those days that was gorgeous. Nothing could go wrong. And as we got near our destination, suddenly it was, we just hit the ground. The pilot miscalculated and brought the plane down in a rice field. Alan said, brace yourself. And we put our hands on the seat in front of us to keep from being thrown forward um, and crash into the seat in front. We started to make our way to the front of the plane and there were so many people. We were in the back of the plane and there was so much fear and panic and screaming and people just scared to death. <coughs> we started to move a little bit and then it wasn't moving, we were stuck. And this thick, acrid smoke and the smell of jet fuel burning was just filling my eyes, my nose, my mouth, and I could feel it filling my lungs. And I turned back to him, I said, Alan, I can't make it, I can't breathe already, and we're so far away. <laughs> so we went back to right by our seats where there was an emergency exit door, which had broken open in the crash, but it was engulfed in flames. And he said, we have to jump out of here. Said, Can you do that? He was very calm and strong and he had his arm on me, his hand on me, my shoulder on my back. And I said, yes, I can. And Alan gave me a push and I tumbled out on the ground. I had a few burns from the flames, but not major. Um, my back was excru in excruciating pain. I turned back to look for Alan in that doorway that was engulfed with the fire and he didn't show and he didn't show. A Myanmese plane carrying 71 passengers made an emergency landing today near Hiho Airport in Shan State. American Susanna Weiss and her husband Alan Locos were on Air Begun Flight 001. Susanna escaped the burning plane by jumping out of an emergency exit. And then he did appear. And I screamed at him to jump, jump. And he did. Landed on the ground and he was terribly burnt. At least two have been killed and another 11 injured. From the moment Alan appeared in the door of the plane in the fire and landed on the ground, I was going to keep him alive. It was so clear that Alan was in horrific shape. Then he just began losing any color in him. And he just lay there looking worse and worse by the minute. And I said, he looks like a corpse. I just thought, just keep going, keep going. One more minute and we'll be there, one more minute. Alan was evacuated to Bumrungrad Hospital in Bangkok, Thailand later that day. It is the premier hospital and it is a good hospital. They were able to stabilize him. And the doctor told me that's all we can do. 
we cannot treat burns of this level here. And I said, well, then we have to get him out of here to where it can be. And the doctor said, there's no point. He's not going to make it anyway. And I said, you don't know this man, <laughs> that we're going to get him to a burn unit. I had professional advice from medical people and they felt that the two best choices would be New York or Singapore. We thought about getting him to the States, but that was way too long, a dangerous journey. And then it turned out that Singapore was the nearest. Alan suffered over 30% burns, comprising second and third degree burns. Critical areas over the hands and scalp were burnt and he was running a temperature. The statistics for survival of a 30 percenter who is 70 years old is 20 percent. Coupled with the fact that he had inhaled smoke in the wreckage, there was a risk he would develop chest complications. With Alan's life hanging in the balance, the doctors could not rule out amputation. In Alan's case, we had to be careful to remove all burnt tissue and yet preserve surviving tissue around the moving parts. That sets the stage for a good result. We were concerned that his burns had gone too deep and removing it would sacrifice the tissue envelope critical for mobility. I had to sign a form that gave permission for them to remove some of Alan's badly damaged fingers. They didn't think they could be saved. When Alan went into surgery, they told me it was going to be so many hours, I thought maybe I should go back to the hotel. And we were driving out of the campus uh, complex and I got a call to come back to the hospital, which made my heart stop. It was this fear that, oh no, what's gone on? What's happened? So Alan died in this surgery. And when I got there, the two hand experts were waiting there and they said to me, don't worry, everything is okay. BK is continuing with the surgery and he's going to be able to save all of Alan's hands. Dr. BK Tan used skin from Alan's thighs as grafts for his fingers and his scalp. He then used donor skin to cover large areas on Alan's legs. The immediate danger was over for now. Donor skin is not permanent and gets rejected after a couple of weeks because the body considers it foreign. For patients like Alan, donor skin buys time for more permanent solutions, for skin to be cultured or graft sites to heal. But that's not enough for major burns victims. 18-year-old Megan Loy suffered 80% burns all over her body. She was injured in one of Taiwan's worst fires, one of 500 young people who were caught in a blaze during a music festival. Megan was rushed home to Singapore, but her condition remained critical. I was not aware of my condition until much, much later, and I think it could have been because my Parents also didn't really tell me much. I don't, I think they didn't want me to worry too much about that. And they wanted me to just focus on the uh, recovery itself. But I recall that at that point, I think I was pretty drugged up with a lot of pain medication. So in a major burn situation, there is no time to lose. Uh, you either improve or you deteriorate rapidly from organ failure, from infection. So for Megan's case, we had to act fast. We had to act decisively. 
In minor burns, there is always sufficient native skin to cover the burnt areas. In Megan's case, we could not rely on conventional methods and had to be creative. Doctors often graft with the patient's skin or use multiple rounds of donor skin. SGH doctors decided to combine both. First, by creating micro pieces that were five millimeters in length and then sandwiching these tiny dots of skin between donor skin and Megan's body. I think it's something like planting rice. You know, to take a, a small piece of skin and to divide it into 400 odd pieces of tiny, fragile little pieces of skin. Micrographs are like seeds sown, which will expand and repopulate over the burnt areas beneath the umbrella of donated skin. The problem? This was a highly labour-intensive technique. The team had not attempted this on such a large scale before. Eight doctors needed to work together for at least six hours to complete the surgery. And Megan's vitals were on a knife edge. Her blood pressure was fluctuating, her kidney functions were affected. We still had to push on to, to do all these long hour surgeries just so that we can restore her skin barrier before infection comes in and overwhelms the body. And of course, we were all anxious and we were hoping that this would work for her. Doctors took a 10 by 10 centimetre piece of skin from Megan's scalp to cover an area 20 times larger. But every tiny five millimetre dot of Megan's skin had to be applied by hand. With the dots spread out, her skin would generate more cells and grow faster. At the same time, the donor skin would provide a barrier against infection, if all went according to plan. So this technique really helped to expedite her treatment and in total, we were able to achieve a coverage of all her burns in about nine surgeries instead of the usual sometimes 20, 30 times of surgical procedures by using the conventional technique. And from then on, a lot of our major burns victims had the advantage of having this technique used on them and we were able to help a lot more patients subsequently. Megan has survived the first of nine six-hour-long operations. But there's no respite. There's a new threat from a formidable enemy, a flesh-eating bacteria. These individuals will then end up with amputations because the flesh literally becomes devoid of oxygen and they die. Doctors have operated on Megan and Loy twice, each one a success. But Megan has just entered one of the most dangerous periods of the post-op phase. Most burn victims' deaths occur within the first two weeks. Even the smallest complication can have fatal repercussions. In massive burn situation, people don't die from the burns injury, but rather complications arising from it infections, organ failures. When wounds do tend to fester, the deterioration can be very dramatic, almost like a snowball effect. And what happens is when you have bacteria invading into your body, if it goes into your lungs, you can get pneumonia, you can get fluid accumulating. So that impacts the delivery of oxygen into your wounds, into your other organs. If your kidneys start to fail, you can't process the toxins and eradicate it from your body. Your liver starts to fail, it fails to produce proteins that can help with your circulation, and you lose control one after another. Once you reach a point where organs are starting to fail, it could be a point of no return. So there was a point where we felt that, you know, her blood pressure starting to drop, her pulse rate is very, very high, her heart is racing. At that point, we felt that Megan might be losing the fight against the infection. 
Megan is attacked by five different bacteria. But amongst them is one of the most feared, Streptococcus, a flesh-eating bacteria. The Streptococcus bacteria is present in a lot of uh, skin in, in among healthy individuals, but when it goes into the body, it can wreak a lot of havoc. So the so-called flesh-eating bacteria is flesh-eating because it rapidly spreads along that layer, almost like an expressway where you can travel to the, the entire country in a short duration. And as they travel along these planes, they release toxins, they dissolve tissues. And one of the things that they affect are the blood vessels. So the blood vessels that supply the skin, for example, or the organs, you know, that gets injured at the same time and so blood flow stops. To the layperson, these individuals will then end up with amputations because the, the flesh literally becomes uh, devoid of oxygen and they die. In Megan's state, where she was very vulnerable, we were scrambling to find the best and the most an appropriate antibiotic at, at that point in time. Amputation is the very last option that burn specialists resort to. In Alan Loka's case, three years before Megan's incident, the SGH doctors were also faced with a similar dilemma. 70-year-old Alan Locus was severely injured in a plane crash in Myanmar. Doctors in Thailand wrote him off, citing his age, lung damage and burns covering one-third of his body. When he arrived in Singapore, his condition was touch and go. Alan had sustained major burns and most of it had required skin grafting. By the first week, I had cleaned up everything and covered it with donated skin. Over his hands and scalp, I had used his own skin. Looking back, Alan must have had the physical reserves to pull him through. His vitals were stable and we decided there was a window of opportunity for him to return back to the US where his family was. Susanna herself was nursing a back injury having jumped out of the plane and being alone in Singapore was extremely challenging. On the day that we were to leave, BK came into my room and he was carrying a couple of books that I had written. So BK said to me, I want to read these books, but I won't read them until you sign them for me. Well, there I am with my hands heavily encased in bandages and I tried to sit up and get a little closer to him and I said, then I tell you what, I promise you that I will sign these books for you. He was saying to me that I am confident that you will be able to do this someday. And if I ever stumbled along the way in recovery, there were always those words there. I had made a promise and I was going to keep that promise. Ready access to donor skin helped doctors fight off the immediate threat to Alan's life. Three years later, they would do the same for Megan. Once your body is not able to maintain adequate blood pressure, organ function, then your skin grafts can turn a corner and get worse. And this would then lead to further deterioration of her wounds the stakes were very, very high, and we were all trying our best with the combination of all the expertise in the hospital. We were trying to prop up her organs to find the most appropriate antibiotics, working closely with the infectious disease specialists, the kidney specialists, the heart specialists to make sure she don't go into this uh, spiral that will eventually lead to her having organ failures and uh, even a uh, very real risk of her dying. Doctors had to wait three days to see if their cocktail of antibiotics worked to eradicate the flesh-eating bacteria altogether. 
and it did. With this battle over for now, the doctors continued with seven more rounds of skin grafts. In total, Megan endured 50 hours of surgery and used 14,000 square centimeters of donated skin. That's almost the size of a single mattress, possible only since the skin bank expanded its capacity after the Bali bombings. Apart from donor skin supplies and cutting edge grafting techniques, burn patients also need much more round the clock intensive care because of the body's exposure to the natural environment. In Singapore, where it's warm, humid, you know, it's an ideal situation when it's mixed with body heat that it becomes like a, almost a petri dish situation. So in an incubated situation, bacteria can divide as rapidly as every 20 minutes. So within an hour, you can imagine they would have replicated three times. Within 24 hours, you might be looking at overwhelming amounts of bacteria that is present in the dressings. And if you, if you delay dressings two, three days, the situation will be such that there will be a lot of enemies at the gate trying to get into the body. If we don't repack the dressing for the patient, the patient will be feeling that they are lying on the pool of water. Situations like this require that you act very fast. And in her case, we had to decide, you know, that we need to change the dressing at least once a day, if not even twice. Megan dressing is very extensive. As it nears the time of the dressing change, you can just hear the nurses preparing all the stuff, the clanging of all the dressings, and then it's just like, oh, the sense of impending doom. For dressing change, right, the pain can go very high. So for a pain scale from a zero to 10, I would say that the pain score can go from seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. It felt as though my skin was being peeled off, just except that it was everywhere throughout my entire body. And I'll just brace myself and my entire body every time each dressing would come off. And there were so many, there were like, probably more than 20 sheets of dressings and multiple layers of dressings that had to be taken off. It was so painful that she would ask the nurses to give her a gauze and roll it out and let her bite in order not to be screaming and shouting. Every um, piece of gauze or every piece of dressing that they took off, I'm like, OK, that's one less. Really, when you're in it, you just can't really think of anything else. There aren't enough distractions out there to, to distract you from the pain. So I would just try and bear as much as I could, but I think there were some instances where it was pretty bad and yeah, you just my voice just echoing throughout the hallways. The fact that I've been lying in bed for so long and not moving about at all, like my muscle bulk had just kind of like wasted away to the point where I was just so weak I couldn't stand up. With the many, many different doctors and the different medical specialties that are looking after Megan. We have to be on the ball to actually keep on top of the timeline and the time frame that is needed to move her and all her limbs, especially uh, areas such as the joint across the elbow or across the armpit, where it can scar or tighten very fast. For example, over the armpit, if it's not moved for one to two days, on the third day, if I move it, it will cause micro tear and uh, further damage. So physiotherapy for someone like Megan uh, going through uh, burns recovery is actually very difficult, very arduous and also painful. So just from the first time that she stood up, she actually blacked out. So yeah, that kind of that kind of happened. I was very embarrassed. For Megan, just to get her to standing for one minute without any support was a major milestone that took us two full weeks of uh, daily physiotherapy sessions. 
it was just really as though I, I had regressed to just being a kid that was helpless and not being able to do anything for herself. It took a long journey of almost up to two months before she was able to walk out of the four walls and walk outside of her room. Now that, that was a big morale boost for all of us involved. It made me want to work harder at each session. That, to us, was something that is a culmination of all our efforts in salvaging uh, a very severe injury uh, to someone who has bounced back onto her feet and ready to face the world. Yeah, I wanted to make them proud. I wanted to make my doctors proud. I had never really understood the weight of a doctor's words and the impact that it had on the patient until I was on the receiving end. It truly takes a village and I didn't really understand the impact of that until I experienced it myself. And I just hope that I don't ever forget that feeling and of how I was treated as a patient because that is exactly how I would want to treat my patients in the future. These don't look so bad, so um, you don't have to turn away from the screen. Um, mostly because of the intense heat. These are the two fingers that were saved, but most of my fingers are bent. There's so much to be grateful for. I've had eight years that most of the medical world said I wouldn't have.